on with the show. Big question here, and I'm going to pose it to everybody at first, is uh, can you fly? Now, if I was to put that out there to you, I know there's a couple of us who believe it, but can you fly on your own? There's not many hands up. Second question is maybe, maybe when you were younger, did you believe that you could fly, maybe fly like Superman? Anybody? Yeah? A few? Um, certainly I was with you. I really believed that, that if I practiced enough, and I, I worked hard enough at it, and I researched enough, I would be able to fly. And I remember many nights going to bed, being put to bed, looking up at my bedroom walls, and right there was a picture just like this one. And I would think, you know, if I just worked hard enough at it, one day I too would be able to fly, and I'd be able to have superpowers. And this is a picture of, of me in the backyard, and just to give some context, I just saved my younger brother. He's sitting up safely on the, on the deck there, away from any kind of danger from a super villain, and I was flying and doing a victory lap. <laughs> now, if you're older than three years old and in the audience, you realize that I'm not actually flying in that photo, and I think if you had asked me at that time, I would have said, um, I'm not flying, but I'm about to take off. I just need a little bit more practice. And this went on and on and on until I realized I was, wasn't actually going to take any flight. You know, I basically worn a circle in my backyard like this, uh, trying to fly. But I, f I decided that, you know, it maybe it was still possible if I could find a tool that would help me. So I went into the house and I looked all over the place and here's what I came up with. I figured if a shopping bag looks like a balloon, and a balloon can fly, then certainly if I attached a shopping bag to my back, I too would be able to fly. <laughs> now initially in the backyard I didn't get any lift, so I figured that it was probably just I need to jump off of something. So I started with, you know, two steps up off the deck, then I was four steps up, and six steps up, and, and fortunately my dad got to me before I tried it off the roof of the house, you know, but I really believed that was possible. Now, time passed, and, and I was still trying to fly, and I remember going into kindergarten, uh, dying to wear my Superman costume to school, but my parents not allowing me to, because even at that age, I think it would be social suicide to show up <laughs> as, a, as a superhero. And, um, and, and, and my, head, my friends helped me adjust my dreams a little bit. I decided after a while that flight on my own just wasn't going to be possible, but that was okay. Because I could adjust my dreams and I could, I could fly still like a superhero, but with other tools. This time, tools like a shuttle. I wanted to be an astronaut. And I knew that to be an astronaut would take an awful lot of hard work. And I'd have to study hard. And in grade one and grade two, I studied hard because I wanted to go to the moon and I wanted to see other planets and potentially other universes. It was a really big deal to me. And it came back to me, uh, Chris Hadfield's book, An Astronaut's Guide to Life on Earth, he talks about this a little bit, and when he was young, he wanted to be an astronaut too, but he didn't tell anybody. A little bit, he kept it a secret. But he asked himself all of the time growing up, what would an astronaut do? Would an astronaut go out and play or stay in and do their homework? He always chose to stay in and do his homework. Would the astronaut accept extra vegetables at dinner, or would they ask for extra dessert? They'd ask for extra vegetables. But more than anything, Chris Hadfield and I both believed in the same thing, was it was gonna take an awful lot of hard work and we weren't gonna give up until we reached our dream. Well, like any superhero, there's always something that can thwart you. With uh, Superman, I'm a bit of a comic book scholar, certainly when I was young, I knew that it was kryptonite that was gonna cause his problems. It was, it was apparent. It was out there, um, and, and we knew that if he touched kryptonite from the planet Krypton, all of his powers would suddenly disappear. Now, as a kid, I didn't know what my kryptonite was. I kind of hoped I didn't have any, and I would just sail right on into the future, and I'd be an astronaut someday. But lo and behold, my kryptonite caught up with me in about grade four. I remember sitting in a grade four class and noticing two things. First was that I was the only one in class using a pencil. I don't know if you guys are familiar with this rule or this law, this law that you can only use a pen if you have neat penmanship and you don't make any mistakes and you don't spell words wrong. Well, I was the one without the pen. I had a pencil. But the bigger tell was this. This was my kryptonite. A simple letter strip. I was sitting there. There were 22 of us. Five of them were named Jason. Uh, the most common name, I think, of the era. And so me and the five Jasons and, and the rest of the class were sitting there, and the only thing that was different in the room that I could see was the fact that I still had a letter strip on my desk. 
Now initially, I, I chalked it up to, well, the teacher must have just been a little bit lazy and forgot to take it off there. And, uh, and that may have been a possibility, but I later came to find out that that wasn't the real, po that wasn't the real reason. The real reason was that I was struggling in school, even if I didn't know it. And I was struggling with some classic reversal issues, you know, the PQDB issue. Uh, and, and initially, um, as I grew up, I thought it was maybe a figment of my imagination that this was a case. But I look back in my journals, and dad is spelled bab. You know, that's just the way it was. Those letters were impossible to figure out. My favorite one was I had a basketball coach in about grade five say, Jason, dribble with your left hand. And so I did this, and I said, that looks pretty much like my left hand. <laughs> Away I go. And then I did this, I said, that's an L2. So uh, I'm back where I started. That trick is just the lousiest of all tricks for me. <laughs> to this day, still doesn't make any sense. Fortunately, I wear a watch now, so I've got that one figured out. But to compound the problem, I also had this issue. I'd find that if I was at the chalkboard and I was writing numbers on occasion, letters would just pop out and I'd end up with an H for a five, or an M for a three, or a B for an eight. And you can kind of see how that, how that might work. I mean, when you see them up there, it makes, makes a lot of sense. My favorite story around that was in grade five, I had Mr. Stallard, and I wrote the simple equation, five plus M equals eight. He said, wow, you're advanced, Jason, you know algebra. Do you have older, do you have older siblings who are teaching you this stuff? <laughs> It's kind of funny because the equation stands, right? I, he probably did think I was really on it. Um, and in school, I did, I did pretty well. You know, I, 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 was a, I was a good student. I was able to sit quietly and listen. I made friends quite easily. I was a little bit athletic in spite of not knowing my left from my right. And so I didn't have many problems in school. And I realized that now, I realize now that what got me through those days was I was a tremendous listener. I listened to everything that everybody said to the point of hyper-focus, and it, and it got me through. But what I wasn't doing at school was my work. I did very little of work at school because I just wasn't able to do it. I didn't have the tools to do it there. So when I got home, I would, I would get home, and this is a little bit like my kitchen table after dinner. This was my dessert every night, was I sat there, and I remember vividly my mom sitting across from me and trying to get me to get my homework done. And it just wasn't happening because she's not an expert in education. I was an elementary or junior high student. Not, we didn't have a chance. So as it would happen, I'm sure some of you may have experienced this, it broke into terrible fights, and I think it, I think it really hurt our early relationship. Because we were fighting over stuff neither of us had control over. The one, thing, the one gift that came out of that, though, is that uh, I believe my mom taught me the value of hard work and perseverance. You know, when she wasn't able to help me anymore, I said, Jason, we just can't do this anymore. Why don't we stop now? I'm going to drive you to school at 7 a.m. I'm going to drop you off, and you're going to work with some people who can help you, who can do better by you. And I believe that uh, those people were, were leveraging the tools, even if they didn't know they were leveraging tools that would help me. And, uh, you know, that was, a, that was a real gift. But what wasn't a gift was a self-esteem piece that really hit hard. Because as, as a student, and I'm sure some of the students in here today will be able to relate with this, um, when, when something is different, like that letter strip, different equates with something wrong. And when something's wrong, you think it's bad. And when it's bad, that equates to all the, oftentimes feeling like you're dumb. And I remember sitting in that grade four classroom, and I wasn't wearing my cape that day. But you know what? That invisible cape slipped right off my back. And from that point forward, my cape was gone. And, 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 the, and the horror of this is that the cape didn't just drop off in grade four and stay dropped off. It lasted with me all the way through school, in spite of you know, me being able to be a good lift listener, or maybe creative, or good at forging strong relationships. I still had that self-esteem issue where, where I thought that everybody in the room was better off than me, and it was easier for them. And, and that self-esteem followed me all the way into university. And I went to university at the University of Saskatchewan and I had a great, great program up there. First I started in chemistry, and again I sat in a chemistry lecture and I looked around and I thought to myself, everybody in here knows more than I do. And I left chemistry. Then I went into business, because they were nice enough to let me into the faculty of business, 
And I looked around and I thought, everybody in here is more talented than me. They know numbers better than me. And I left business. Ironically, not being able to read very well, uh, one of my few options left was a Bachelor of Arts, and I went into an English degree. At which point, again, <laughs> these people all read better than me. You know, there's a, there was a real moment where I was taking a Shakespeare course, and a Shakespeare professor insist that I perform a, a soliloquy solo. And, and he didn't give me a break, and I remember not finishing that soliloquy because I was struggling with the words, and it comes back to this reversal piece, and, uh, and he was a Shakespearean scholar, so we wanted it perfect, but I remember to this day just how my blood ran cold in, in, in that class. And that was one of my last days in the English program. Then, you know, I dropped out of most programs, and there was openings still in one, one section of school, and it was Education of Exceptional Children, and I decided to go there. So I went into Education of Exceptional Children as a way to get into education if I was able to raise my grades enough. And, and from there, I, I went into education, I started to find my passion, okay? Uh, but what really happened, some of these gifts come at different times along the way, and I was, I was in university and I need to find a way to make some money to go back, because clearly I was making a career of this, I was gonna spend my life in university at this rate. And so, I got a job in the oil patch. Now the oil pat patch in Saskatchewan involved driving about 450 kilometers a day on dirt roads. They gave me my own truck and I was in there by myself and I just loved it. But in that truck, I just had an AM radio. And I'm not much a fan of country music, and, uh, and so I had to find another option. And as I drove around, um, I realized I had a cassette deck, and, and I didn't have any, many cassettes even at that time, but I knew the public library had books on tape. Now, I'd never really finished a book in my entire life. I'd certainly listened to books be read to me, or any of those things, but I just get so frustrated with slowing down of the word recognition. Uh, and, and I started to listen to these books and I started to realize there was a different world out there. I listened to Shakespeare, I listened to Mark Twain, I listened to Wayne Dyer and the Dalai Lama. All summer, every summer, blissfully listening to books as I drove around the country fields. I listened to about one book every two days and if you work 100 days in the summer, and that's about what I did, you can do the math pretty quick. I listened to about 50 books a summer, equivalent of 200 books in about four summers. All of a sudden, I went from the least read person I knew to potentially one of the best read people I knew in the course of this time. But what was really happening was I was starting to discover the tools that would help me. And the tool of being able to listen to a book was one that had never been presented to me aside from my mom reading my homework to me in the past. And so back to university I go and I end up in a phys ed class of all places and I'm taking this phys ed class from Dr. Louise Humbert at the University of Saskatchewan and she's standing up there and like all great teachers she got distracted and she got distracted talking about her struggles in university and how she was just never able to do um, a great job until she figured out one thing and she said the thing that she figured out was what was lacking was a conversation with books because she, a little bit maybe like me, is a conversationalist, and, uh, and she never had a conversation with books until somebody taught her how to use margin notes. And I just sat back and I was like, aha, there's the second tool. All of a sudden I start to feel the strings of that cape tightening up a little bit and my superpowers coming back. From that point forward on to this day, there's not a book of mine that I own that isn't full of conversations, questions, answers, meanderings, wonderings. They're actually pretty fun to look back at. So, here we go. This is the start of the superpowers coming back. Now, as we transition into the second part of the presentation, um, we're going to talk about teaching students to find their superpowers. Okay, we'll call it bringing the cape back campaign. And that's what I want for all of our students. I want us to be able to bring that cape back. Whether you believe in superheroes or not, there's that piece. So, uh, Venn diagram, all right, here. Uh, <laughs> We've got universal design on one side, and we've got some affirmations on the other side. And I think this is really the secret to super schools. Okay, let's go through this. Universal design, started by Ronald L. Mace at NC State University. He was uh, bound to a wheelchair, and, and he was an architect. And so he decided that he would find ways to make places universally accept, or accessible. A great example of this is the curb cut. We all have them in our neighborhoods, but there was a day, and many of us will remember them, where there was no curb cuts. It was just the square 90 degree curbs. Well, Ronald L. Mace and his colleagues decided that if you curb cut it for people who have wheelchairs, it doesn't only help people with wheelchairs, it helps everybody. 
It helps that student who's learning to, or child who's learning to ride a bike. It helps that person who's pushing the shopping cart down the road. And so he took that and he transitioned it into architecture. Now a lot of great educators have gone ahead and done that with education. Saying that, you know, just because it helps one person doesn't mean it's not going to help everybody. So why don't we start universally designing our spaces? It's a pre presentation all unto its own, but I'll focus on two specific areas. First one is classroom design. I'm proud to say in our schools here at Rundle, and Rundle Academy in particular, we really ascribe to classroom design. Classroom design elements are many, and there are just a couple on the board. One are the node chairs, which are developed in the design lab at Stanford. They're not only ergonomically correct, but they also allow for just a little bit of movement, which is completely appropriate. I guarantee you there's not a person in the audience today that doesn't want to move just a little bit right now. There's also the idea of standing tables. We know that uh, the ability to stand up and move is, is essential, not only for kids who might have attention issues, but for all of us. I mean, we found out that it's good for health, it's good for the mind, and it's good for the body. And the last one is, is one of my most favorite, is the very top one. It shows a, a whiteboard wall. Okay, and it doesn't have to be a whiteboard wall, but I think whiteboards are very, very important because I believe there's this idea of impermanence out there that empowers learners. And it's this idea, it kind of comes back to the pen rule. When you write something down in pen, it's a permanent record. Now, if you know that you're correct, that permanent record is really empowering. You feel like, yes, I've got it, it's gonna be there forever. But let's say you're learning a concept and you're not sure it's gonna be correct and you write it in pen. Are you as likely to take a chance? Probably not. So this is why I'm a huge proponent of, of whiteboard surfaces everywhere we're far more likely to take a chance in our learning if we know that we're going to be able to erase it one second letter later and try again if we need to. It's, a, it's just a simple design principle that I think is, is really, really powerful. The second is instructional design. And there's a lot of talk around this, the whole um, stand and deliver, perhaps like I'm doing right now, or the sit and get, that's the, you know, technical term for what we're doing here too, so I'm hoping you're getting it. Okay, but uh, I don't think it has to be that way. I think we can leverage different modalities. You know, how much more would have I learned if I was able to listen to books on tape when I was in school instead of waiting until I got into the oil field to find that one out? You know, and I think when you think about the modalities, whether it's auditory, kinesthetic, or visual, I think as teachers, this is your call to action, leverage those, and it doesn't have to be a differentiated technique, but just think about those different angles when you're working with your students. Because each time you shut one of those angles out and one of the students isn't able to get the information, that cape falls just a little bit farther off. The last part, really near to my heart, because I, I really believe that nothing happens. You can be the best teacher in the world, but unless you follow uh, the affirmations on the other side of this Venn diagram, I don't think you're going to get very far with anybody. I can is the first one. Unless you believe you can, and this is the students here, nothing is going to work. And so teachers, as you start to see that cape fall from the shoulders of your students, the best thing you can do is help them understand those two simple words, I can. And when I can is gone, there's nothing left, okay? So I can. The second one, once you believe that you can, it's a matter of understanding how. And again, call to action for the teachers. This is our biggest job out there, is to try to help students understand how they learn. Because being different isn't wrong. Not at all. Being different is unique. Being different is being diverse. Being different is what this entire conference is all about. So once we understand and embrace that diversity, and truly understand how we learn and what tools we use, then we can really start to move on it. The second piece is, students, once you understand how you learn, don't be afraid to share that with other people. Just like I've shared today that reading was not really my strength. You know, if I wasn't, if I wasn't willing to share that, I think I'd be far, far behind uh, where I am currently today. So your biggest strength as you move past the walls of this school or any other school you attend is to be able to help other people understand what kind of learner you are. 
And the last one, this is, the, this is what my mom taught me at those kitchen tables. She never taught me any math, and she didn't teach me how to read, okay? But she taught me how to persevere. And she taught me what grit was all about. And she taught me that even when it feels too hard to carry on, carry on, carry on, carry on. And students, this is on you. Nobody else can do it but yourselves. That will to go on when you think that there's nothing else, that, that is the third and most important part of this. I can, I understand, and I will. Now to close with a story, uh, this is my, my dear friend, Brenda Gilchrist, and she was my mentor when I first started teaching. And uh, I, I was a lost soul. I really didn't know what I was doing in the classroom, and I was terrified to teach, and I was terrified to stand in front of students. Um, and, and I said to Brenda, I said, Brenda, what's the one thing I need to be able to do in that classroom? And she said, Jason, you just need to believe in them, and they will believe in themselves. I said, wow, that's powerful. So the last affirmation that wasn't on the, on the board that will take you, take you to flight and sec secure that, that cape, that invisible cape we're all looking for, is I believe. And just a brief story, uh, Brenda gave me this card. It's I believe, and, and on the inside it says, I believe you can fly. And teachers, I don't think there's any other gift that you can give to your students than to help them believe that they fly. Now, a sad ending to the story is uh, Brenda's no longer with us. She passed away far too young. And, um, you know, and she believed in these pieces right to her last days. And as part of her obituary, which I know she wrote, she said, magnificently we will fly into the mystic. And your mystic may well be learning, and I hope it is. And I hope that if you have people who believe in you, you can fly too. And my parting wish is, uh, you know, I, I can't wear a cape around. It's, it's inappropriate for a headmaster. <laughs> so so when, I, when I need strength, I just put on my Superman cufflinks, and they, they carry me on through, okay? And when I have a chance to go and visit my niece and my nephew, they also believe that they can fly. And I want you guys, each and every person in this room, to help these guys continue to believe that they can fly. Thank you very much, and thanks for a wonderful TED Talk.